It's a little mechanical. I do it because it needs to be done because uh, as a little child I've been taught to do it and I do it just the way I've done it. But when once I have the responsibility to preach, I start doing things a little differently. I, 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 I take the position that, well, I've got this privilege to deliver God's word to the people and I want to make sure I listen to preach the sermon, standing, leveraging the strength of your character, the width of your knowledge, the creativity of your wisdom, the depth of your understanding and the quality of your skill to stand because the word of God enjoys us to stand. You will excuse me, I would like us to read from Ephesians chapter Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the for we wrestle not and blood is stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all take the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery deaths of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the word of the spirit which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak so that's um, the letter written to the Ephesians by Paul. Actually, wrote verse 10 to verse, he would have said, spoken a lot, then of summary, the, the, the achieving set out, and, and he starts to on the other side. And that finally is translated, Lakuton. Ni Uton have collect but in essence it can summarize what he did there and level just to stand friends between standing and with then he go achieve that and he goes on to tell us what are we up to what do we have and finally he put in what he wants us so stand tells us how to cost us another mean in the odd mean a lot somebody is time for example needs to be up and being it means it means when somebody is constant about what for start use that word you can say draw that lean go make soft but what about withstanding there's a subtle difference between standing and withstanding even though both lead to the same end result. One of the Christian writers that I do enjoy reading is a man by the name of Martin Lloyd Jones. Martin Lloyd Jones says that we stand conveys the same idea as stand, but with something added to it. That is, withstanding is more than merely standing. When you withstand, you are doing more than just standing. Withstanding implies standing against something. 
when you say somebody is withstanding, it means the person is standing despite the fact, despite the fact that something is seeking to cause the person not to stand. So that's the subtle difference between standing and withstanding. Something intends to push you down. Something wants to take you away from that position of being erect, from that position of being upright, from that position of being straight. It wants to push you down. It implies confrontation. So whenever we're talking about withstanding, it is implied that there is confrontation. And that is the subtle difference between stand and withstanding. When we say somebody should stand, stand up, usually we are saying that the person should get up, pull yourself together, get it together. Maybe things are not looking well and we say, come on, be a man, even when you're a woman. Stand. To withstand is to brace yourself for conflict. You brace yourself up whatever you need to make you remain standing against what the conflicts are. You need to brace yourself up with it. You are ready to resist what is coming at you when you are withstanding. In the, process, in the position of standing, you are ready to resist what wants to cause you not to stand. First Peter chapter 4, around verse 12, says that we should not consider trials as a strange thing. We should not see trials as something that comes from outside the, 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 the agreement we have. Really, when we take a stand for Christ, what we are doing is we are bringing ourselves into the plan of God to thwart the work of the devil. And the devil has already designed a program to make us fail because that does not augur for his own, or does not augur well for his own purposes. So I dare say therefore that as Christians we are in a conflict. We are in a conflict. Just by declaring our stand for Christ, we are already in a conflict. And so we have to stand and withstand. Otherwise we end up uh, as failures. So these are the issues that Paul brings out in the first part of that passage we read, we read that we need to stand, we need to withstand the conflicts that may come against us in, 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 in our Christian work. Then Paul goes on to tell us how to maintain our stand. And his recipe is that we put on the whole armor of God. The word whole there is significant because it's, it, is, it makes it clear that there, is, there are various dimensions to this armor of God and that we need to address each of the dimensions. We need to put on the whole armor of God. And then Paul goes on to address why we need to, address, to put on the whole armor of God. He said, so that we can stand and I add, withstand the fiery darts of the devil. Darts are bad enough, but fiery darts are even worse. These are darts that have fire, that when they hit you, you are not only suffering from the penetration, you are always also suffering from the heat that accompanies it. So the, Paul admonishes us to put on the whole armor of God because there are darts being fired at us. 
we cannot afford to run from these darts. So we need to face it. We need to deal with it. And the only way to achieve that is to put on the whole armor of God. Having accepted that we are in a conflict, having accepted that we have to withstand what is coming at us, then we need to take advantage of God, what God puts at our disposal. Now, Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God as the reason, because Paul tells us to put up the whole armor of God because we know we are in battle but then he goes on to explain that the battles we are going through are not ordinary battles. he said for we wrestle not against flesh and blood it is not a conventional battle it is a really really unconventional battle where things are coming at us from various ends let me, let me di di digress a little to illustrate a non-conventional battle and what people need to do when you are in a non-conventional battle. Many years ago, after the fall of the Oyo Kingdom, various Yoruba states went into war and they fought against each other for a hundred years. Ijebu against Egba, Ibadan against Igesha, Igesha against. It was just war all over the place. E, e, the Igesha army had a general called Ogedengbe. His oriki was Ogedengbe Agbogunborun Atikmokmolojogun. It means Ogedengbe, the great strategist, the brave, clever general. So he was not a, a general, I mean, it was a serious general. The Ijisha camp was fighting against Ibadan. At a point in the war, Ogedengbe went and obtained Ibadan facial masks, a uh, max. He took the Ibadan max. And when the Max healed, he infiltrated the Ibadan army. And because they saw the Max, they took him as one of them. And he was able to find out their strategies and their secrets. And he came back and they continued the war. And he was beginning to deploy these knowledge of their strategies against them. Then at a particular point in the war, you know, this was a war that they fought, you know, armed combat. They, they wrestled each other down. They, you know, you know Yerekwe, they use Yerekwe. You know, these, uh, these, these um, hairy things that come from some certain pods. If it touches, like pepper spray. Uh, they use Yerekwe, they use uh, short swords, they use cutlasses, you know. These are this kind of war they were fighting. But at a point in the war, Ogedengbe had a sound that defined the war. The sound was Kiriji. And that's why he talk about the Kiriji war. That sound was the sound of a cannon. Because the Ijebu, because of their proximity to the coast, they had relationships with the Europeans that were coming to trade. So they were able to obtain cannons. And the Ibadan too obtained a cannon. And they took the cannon to the war against the Igeshas. And they shot the cannon. And the sound was Kiriji. And this clever, deft, brave warrior that had taken the pain of making marks at old age. You know, people don't make marks at old age. And, and penetrated, infiltrated the Ibadan army, found that all he has learned was now almost at naught. But one of the things he learned when he was, when he infiltrated the army, was that he knew the Ibadan were beginning to negotiate for cannons. So when he heard the sound, he knew 
that they had obtained cannons. So he beat a retreat. He called his army and said, this is no more a conventional weapon. It is when you have proximity that you can put your on somebody. When a cannon is flying far away and hitting your town, Yerikwe has become useless. Short swords, cutlass, and I mean, the, the whole equation had changed. But Ogerenbe knew that some Igesha had been taken as slaves and they had returned to Lagos. We had people like Hastro and we had people like the grandfather of our dear Lady Thomas, Atali Thompson. So we had Igesha like Thompson, Hastro. So Ogedengbe sent emissaries to Lagos, to the Hastrops and the Thompsons and other returning slaves that were Igesha to negotiate for cannons. And they obtained the cannons and they were still meted. And they fought and fought and fought until the British came and called the truce. And uh, you know Bauer's Tower? We talk about Bauer's Tower. Captain Bauer, he was the one that ar arrested Ogedengbe in the end. And that was how the war ended. Because Ogedengbe realized that it was no more a conventional war that he had to take extraordinary steps to be able to continue what was going on. And for us as Christians, that is the kind of situation we find ourselves. We are not in a kind of war where you can spread your <laughs> you, <laughs> you are in a war in which not just darts are coming, they are fiery darts. So that is why you need the whole armor of God. And what is this whole armor of God? Let us look at the whole armor of God. Then you see that it actually is designed to protect you against fiery darts. It says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that he may be able to withstand in the evil day. Stand therefore having your loins guard around with truth. Use truth as your belt. What does a belt do? A belt holds you together, gives you a form of integrity, makes you smart, makes you mobile. If I wasn't wearing a belt, I would have pulled these trousers up some three or four times now, and I'll be distracting you, and I'll be distracting myself. Imagine if I was running and having to pull the trousers up. Have you ever seen uh, young people who are grown? It's like, <laughs> I mean, it's very, very funny sight. I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing a belt does. Well, and that is what truth represents. It makes you straight. It gives you some form of integrity. It gives you mobility. You are able to maneuver because you have truth. You see, the problem with lies is that for every lie, you need a system of other lies to make it stand for a season. Not even stand forever. You need a complex system of other lies to make it stand for a season. I remember mean, this complex system of other lies also need complex system of other lies to make them stand also for a season. So the when you are in truth, you don't need to think about okay, what did I say the last time? I remember one day I was in England. My, my driving license had expired, and a friend of mine said, ah, it's easy, uh, just give me a passport photograph and give me some, something naira, I will do it. So I gave him the money and the passport photograph, and he brought the driving license, and I was happy, and I put the driving license in my pocket. And I was in England, I wanted to change some money, and they said, do I have any ID? And I didn't have my passport with me, so I produced my driving license, and the lady looked at the driving license and said, wow, today's your birthday. I said, <laughs> <laughs> because it was not the first of August. The man just wrote anything on the. <laughs> he didn't ask for my birthday. So when he got there, you know, we don't take things seriously. He just said, like, birthday. He just put one date. And it happened to be the day I went to change money. 
And the woman said, wow, today is your birthday. Congratulations. I said, <laughs> when I man, When I managed to leave there, I took my money. I went home. I just took a scissors and cut the driving license into two. When I came home, I started all over again. <laughs> so that is what happens when, when, when you don't have the belt of truth. The things, you won't know what's coming at you because you, you, are not, you don't have integrity around you. So that's the, the first element of the um, whole armor of God. And then the breastplate of righteousness. That when you are righteous, when you are in good standing with God, when you are in the position that God expects you to be, and you are supporting that with what you are doing, then that is the breastplate of righteousness. Remember, the breastplate is protecting certain vital organs of your body, particularly the heart. Those who know uh, the human anatomy when they are at war, they know where to shoot. Because when they shoot your heart, you stop uh, pumping blood and you go immediately. I mean, really, really sorry situation, but uh, I remember watching some Nigerian police doing some extrajudicial killing and they said on, it was on the YouTube don't waste my bullet though target his heart so that's how important the heart is so when you have the breastplate of righteousness your vital organs are protected the fiery dart will come quite alright but if the fiery dart hit your breast area because you have a breastplate which is righteousness, which is right standing with God and right doing, you have nothing to fear. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. That your feet are protected with the power of the gospel with which you are using this, which you are using this feet to actually propagate. In moving around, propagating the gospel because it is part of the commission we were left to make disciples of all nations and above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked you've had the breastfield of righteousness you have your uh, loins guard with truth you have uh, the, your feet shod with the gospel and you now have this shield which you can maneuver in case the darts are coming maybe not in the area that the press will have covered you can move it to take care of that and take the helmet of salvation salvation covers the head which is probably the most vital and uh, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God and we need to be immersed in the word of God so these are the elements of the whole armor of God and we need to take on every one it is the whole armor not we don't have a choice we can't choose we can't uh, say we'll take this and take and not take that now what we have seen in Ephesians tells us that we are in conflict and tells us we need to stand and we need to withstand and we should not be surprised that we are in conflict because surprise is a great war strategy. If you can be caught unawares, it is a great strategy for your opponent. Now, if we leave um, Ephesians and go to Second Peter chapter 1. Let's go to Second Peter. If 
we we'll read from verse 5 of 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you they make you that they make you that you shall neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now it is at that point that I get inspired by our theme for the year. Now we've talked about the whole armor of God and it's saying that in addition to that, it, the, uh, Ephesians had, had dealt with, as it were, the spiritual dimensions of this. Now we are now going to the natural, physical aspects where we need to do things, I mean, clearly that we humans need to do to, to, uh, to excel. When we look at those things that are listed in uh, Second Peter, we see that at the core of it is this concept that we're dealing with of character. Character. Character is an indication of what you stand for. Your character indicates what you stand for, where you stand on issue. Character, the dictionary says, is the totality of the mental and moral qualities that make a person distinctive. Character is the totality of the mental and moral qualities that make a person distinctive. So it is character that make that character as it were defines you your character defines you the, it, it is the means by which people know you for you who you are character encompasses concepts such as honesty ethics charity and whichever way you Whichever way you take these issues, whatever disposition you have towards honesty, remember we talked about truth, the whatever way, what your disposition to ethics, whatever your disposition to charity is, defines your character. When we talk about character being mental qualities, we are talking about how you think, what you know, because these two determine what your character is. If you do not know certain things, if you are not aware of certain principles, you will behave oblivious of them, and it will define you. People will say, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, do that. For example, you know, there was a time pastor made a lot of, uh, um, uh, raised awareness about hand washing. You know, if you don't know that it is important to wash your hands, you will do things and you won't wash your hands. You go and people just look at you. Ah, he didn't wash his hands. I remember in, uh, I think it was uh, Big Brother Africa, that they noticed that the Nigerians didn't wash their hands when they went to the toilet. I think everything is all right. So what you know, is seriously, the word of God understand that, that makes you distinct. You'll be informed by truth, tense. They go, they say, ah, Matthew. And he was explaining how uh, many years ago I had a boss. He was a, we, we saw him as a very difficult man. He was very strict, straight and narrow. And when he was to leave the organization I was working for, uh, we gave him a send off. And during the send off, he made his uh, speech. And he was talking about himself. And he said, well, you may think I'm a difficult person and this and that and that and that. And he said, you must have character. He said, if you don't have character, 
they will pull you into all sorts of things. But if you have character, there are certain things we will never invite you to. You will never have the moral dilemma of say, should I do it? Should I not? Because they would not invite you into it. The man retired and about a year or two ago, I ran into him in um, the tantalizer in Bodiga. Quite old man, one of those old, heavy, strong civil servants. And we sat down, in those days I was, uh, I think grade level two officer, eight officer or something. And he was big, big, big. So I couldn't, but I now found myself sitting next to, uh, next to him and he was talking to me and I reminded him about what he said about character and how I have used it to guide my behavior and I have been saved of very many things that people have drawn into and they got into trouble and they say, uh, and he laughed and he now started telling me stories about the state government and about how he was maligned and about how he avoided a lot of things to the extent that when the military government came, they didn't find anything that could implicate him, even though very many others were implicated. So that is the value of character. That is the value of character. So we're talking about character and we're talking about knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and skill. Now, I'm really short of time now. Let me rush through. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Knowledge is that based on which you make decisions and take actions. Whenever you make a decision or you take an action, it is because certain knowledge has come into your circumstance. And it is important. If you don't have the right knowledge, you will make the wrong decisions and take the wrong actions and you will pay for it. So that is why knowledge is very, very important. What about wisdom? Wisdom is the creative application of knowledge. Creative application in the sense that if you say something is creative, what it means is that the person doing it has not seen it anywhere before. He thinks through it and believes this is a good way to do it. So when you apply knowledge in such a way and uh, when in the, in the morning, um, uh, in the first service, Sister Fatu Roti asked, made the comment after my sermon, and she said that she had always seen wisdom as the profitable application of wisdom. And if you look at it carefully, you see that the creative application of wisdom becomes valid only if it leads to profitable ends. So in a sense, Wisdom is the creative application of knowledge and in the other sense, it is the profitable application of knowledge. So at the end of the process that you are applying the knowledge, wisdom is the creative application. At the point of getting the outcome, the output of that application, it is the profitable application because if you, uh, if you claim to apply knowledge creatively just because it's your own way and it doesn't come to a, a profitable end of what you use is the creativity in it. So that's what knowledge is. What about understanding? Understanding is a level of knowing that makes it possible for you to infer from what you know that which you do not know. I gave the example in the first service that if you see an animal walking on two legs, it has a beak, it has feathers, well, you make a conclusion that it is a... Will it produce a live child or an egg? Have you seen it given birth before? No. From what you have seen, you have inferred 
what you have not seen. That requires understanding. And whenever a person says, oh, I understand, the meaning is the person has found a place to put what you have told it to the extent that they are able to infer what they have not seen from what they have seen. They are not able to use it in other environments. Now, what about skill? Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, they are like a, a theoretical face of this whole process. But when you come to skill, you are talking of practical, doing, experience type of thing. I gave the example also in the morning that I'm sure everybody here, if I tell you that you put a nail on wood and you hit it with a hammer, what will happen? The, the nail will go into the wood. That is knowledge. Try it. Then you find that you hit your own nail rather than the nail. That is experience. That is skill. If you do not have the skill, the knowledge may not be profitable. So these are what God expects of us. He's given us knowledge. He's given us wisdom. He's given us understanding. He's given us skill. The next thing he expects from us is to hone those things like talent. They are like talent. You know, I, I grew up as the son of a pastor of a Methodist church. And uh, when I was young, they'll say in the service, when they, usually when they read the, the Bible, the reader will end by saying, may the Lord add his blessings to his words. As I grew older, I noticed that God doesn't add blessings. He multiplies blessings. Why does God multiply blessings? Because it's better. If you have a blessing of two and God adds four, you get six. But if you multiply four, you get eight. If you have one and it adds 100, you get 101. You know, that's not a good example. You ask if, if you have four and it adds 100, you get 104. But if you multiply four, you get 400. So that's why God does that. But you know the, the uh, short end of the stick. If you have zero, if you add, if it gives you 1,000, you still end up with zero. So God expects you to put in effort. God expects you to enhance what he has given you. And that is the whole essence of the parable of talents. That whatever you are given, you are supposed to improve upon it. You are supposed to enhance it. I read somewhere that the best way to use any resource is to invest it. And I thought it meant that if you have money, uh, don't buy a car. Invest in, no. When I read it, we said, no, 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 that even when you buy a car, make sure that that car is an investment. That it is going to yield results more than the money you spent in buying the car. If you build a house, make sure it is going to yield. If you, if you take a break, if you, if you go for a vacation, make sure that that vacation is going to enliven you to be able to do a lot more and make a lot more for, than you, what you spent on the vacation. That is the whole principle of talent. Now, when God gives us knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and skills, we are expected to invest it. And how do we invest it? Practice. Develop it. Improve it. Make it a lot more than it is. And that was why Jesus, the, the story that Jesus told us, the parable of the talents, all the servants that increased what they had, no matter how little, got the blessings of their boss. The one that said, see what he gave me, eh, I will not do anything with it. They took even that from him and gave it to the people who were productive, the person who was productive. And that is what our God expects of us, expects of us, of the wisdom, of the skill, of the understanding that he has given us. Now, the way the two of them work together, we have character on one side. And if you look at that, our key, you see that character 
plays a very, very important. It is the stem. It is the stem from which all these others, the wisdom and the uh, understanding uh, branch off. So character is fundamental. If you have wisdom, you have knowledge, you have understanding, you have skill, but you do not have character, you are a dangerous weapon. Because you are bound to apply your wisdom, your skill, your understanding in ways that do not augur well. During the first service, I made the example of Hitler. Hitler arranged to kill people and conceal the killing scientifically. If you, there was this film about uh, the Second World War when they were debating where to have, whether to go for to Germany for the Olympic Games. And they, all the bad things they've done, they were able to sweep it behind. They, they, they had roads which they put posters uh, that gave the impression that they were not doing what they were doing. Immediately after they finished the uh, Olympics and they went, they continued. They killed so many people, yet very, very few, very few people knew. Anybody that entered into their, their uh, gas chambers never came out to tell the story. So people outside didn't even know what was going on. They just found that people went, they thought they were taken somewhere else. They did so much that people did not know until after the war that some of the things, some of the atrocities that were committed were discovered only after the war. That is what happens when wisdom, when knowledge, when understanding and skill is not built upon the base of character. So, returning to what Paul tells us in Ephesians and what Peter told us, we now see that our knowledge, our understanding, our skills, our wisdom are supposed to be deployed based on the character that we derive from the sword of the Spirit, from the Word of God. We are supposed to be influenced, our values are supposed to emanate from the Word of God. We are supposed to have the integrity that the belt of truth gives us. We are supposed to have the breast placed that salvation give us. We are supposed to have the helmet, that we have we had the helmet of salvation. We are supposed to have our feet shod with the message of the gospel. These are the things that define our character as Christians. And if we do not take heed to allow these to define our characters, the gifts that God has given us, even if we multiply them, we invest them, will be applied to negative ends. And for us as Christians, that God has placed on the earth to hold brief, as it were, for him, through whom God wants to establish his kingdom on earth, we need to ensure that we hone our skills, we invest our knowledge, we invest our um, wisdom, our understanding, but all based on the substrate of character, such that only good will come out of our efforts. Because if we do not maintain that base, that foundation of characters, whatever we do, we, we will be less than desirable because it is the character that God placed in us that he designed to apply the controls, to define our go areas and our no-go areas. So for us as Christians, we need to invest, to improve, to develop our skills, to develop our knowledge, to develop our understanding, to develop our wisdom. And we need to do that because that is, that is God's purpose. That is God's plan. When, he's, 
when he created the heavens and the earth and he gave the dominion to man he told us to replenish the earth and to replenish the earth we need all these uh, wisdom we need knowledge we need understanding we need skills but all these without character you are just like a loose cannon that can rot a lot of havoc wreak a lot of havoc in the world and that is not the desire of God for us as Christians we need to take heed of our character we need to ensure that our character is situated is founded on the Word of God that the virtue that the morals that everything that we do are not based on what we find around us they are based on what the Word of God says because that is the program that is the design that God has made to ensure that the gifts that we are giving us will be used into profitable ends. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you because your word is light. Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, we ask that it continue, that it germinates in our hearts, that it will not be snuffed out. We ask that it rests on good land, good earth in our hearts so that it can germinate and bring up tenfold and hundredfold. Father, we are asking that even as we go into this year, you teach us to hone our skills. You teach us to develop our knowledge. You teach us to develop our understanding. You teach us to be wise. You teach us to apply our knowledge with creativity to productive, to profitable ends. We ask that the skills that we develop will be, will be to positive ends. And Father, we are asking that, that your word, the totality of your whole armor that you have recommended to us in your word, that we need to stand against the fiery darts of the evil one that father you help us to build our character upon it to the extent that the way we deploy that that you are you have given us our knowledge our wisdom our understanding our skill will be only to the glory and honor of your holy name for in jesus christ's name i've prayed amen Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together once again for him this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. He has done thorough justice to the word of God this morning. But let me just raise a question to us this morning. You have two doctors. Dr. A and Dr. B. Now Dr. A has... A very bad attitude he doesn't care he's nonchalant but he's abusive but he knows his profession very well then you have dr. B who doesn't know his profession very well but he's nice he's kind he's loving he's cheerful and then they say you're supposed to undergo a surgery the question to you at the house this morning is which doctor will you choose a or b your answer a or b why a because he's knowledgeable he has skill but what about his character you don't need the character at the moment <laughs> you just need the skill at that moment to survive but what about the other doctor you prayerfully pick the other doctor <laughs> because he's nice, he's loving, and he's kind. I, I brought that in just as a twist and as a contradiction. In other words, God doesn't want us to be half big Christians. He wants us to integrate the two. He wants us to have character as well as skill, as well as knowledge, as well as understanding, and as well as wisdom. And that's why we call it the full 
gospel of Jesus Christ. But more importantly, that what Dr. Adibola has shared to us this morning is that we need to develop our character. And you know, the most interesting part for me is this, when he said we need to anchor it on the word of truth. Maybe because I'm an, an engineer, I'll put it this way. The word of truth is the middle part of your body. If you divide your body into three, you have the upper part, the lower part, you have the middle. The middle is your waist, and that's where the belt goes. If you remove the waist, I don't think any other thing can function either up or down. It's a fulcrum. That is what we call in physics the balance point of your life, and that's why they call it the fulcrum. It's like the scissors. You have the tips, you have the two angles, and you have a dot in the middle. That's the balance point. So the word of God is a balance point as what is going to bring character into your life. So when we read the word of God, we study the word of God, it brings you to the place whereby the Bible says that we as with an open face, looking into a glass, beholding the image of God, are changed from glory to glory. That is how character is formed from the word of God. And that's what he has told us today. He talked about the helmet. Do you know why the helmet is important? Even go and look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, where it talks about Goliath. The Bible said his helmet was of bronze. You know why? Because the issues of life will hit you. He says today they are lesbians, today they are not lesbians, today it is Trump. Tomorrow the women are marching. They want to hear a voice. Because the storms of life will hit. And what does it hit? It comes against the mind. The devil is very crafty. He says he will throw the fairy dart at your heart, at your mind. So you need to protect your head. You shod your feet with the gospel, the breastplate of righteousness. I love Roman films. Go and see how the Roman dresses. And when they dress for war, they take every item one by one and they strap it before they go to war. So God is saying for you to build character, stay on these things. And then in addition to character, begin to take wisdom, which is the beginning of the fear of the Lord. Begin to get knowledge, wisdom, and understanding and put them together. And you know the very interesting thing? If you remove wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and skill, you can't unlock the door. Did you notice that? So God is saying, character plus all this will unlock a door. So if you find out why the door is locked, go and check the teeth of your key. Something is missing. So in other words, God is saying, have character, but have every other thing else. God bless you in Jesus' name. We're just going to go straight to the announcements. Hallelujah. Let me invite my brother, Pastor Olumide, to give us the announcements this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.